Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for your attention. Um, 2020 has been a very long year, and this could be a long Zoom, so it might be nice if I was talking about puppies or kittens or bunny rabbits. I'm not, but I appreciate your attention. Um, I'd like you to meet Vertina Brown. Vertina says gun violence has spiked in her Brooklyn neighbourhood since the pandemic began. She hears gunshots almost nightly. This is a crazy world we live in right now. Anything can happen, Bertina told me. Vertina knows how crazy the world can be. Her daughter Tiara was gunned down at a street festival in Brooklyn in 2016. My name is John Philp. I'm an engagement journalist and video producer serving the gun safety community made up of gun violence survivors, their families and other advocates working to reduce America's gun deaths, people such as Vertina. I serve this community through Gun Country, an ongoing multi-format online project I created that tries to reboot the conversation about guns in America. Gun Country weaves together news, narrative, dialogue and advocacy to explore the hold guns have on us and also to amplify efforts to reduce gun violence. Gun Country provides a well-informed experience that takes in all perspectives across a range of formats and promotes dialogue. The US has a homicide rate 25 times that of other high income countries. More than 100 Americans die every day from guns. Women and minorities make up a disproportionate amount of these deaths. Sinead Johnson's son, Kedrick Morrow, was killed in 2010, just a few weeks before he was to attend college on a scholarship. Gun Country was built to serve this community but to stem the bleeding, we need everyone at the table. Gun country grew out of what I felt was a storytelling gap. We talk a lot about guns, but we never resolve many of the biggest issues. There's a sense of deep division. Whether or not someone owns a gun has become the most powerful predictor of a person's political affiliations, more than gender, sexuality, race, or geography. The gun lobby takes advantage of these divisions and talks about the gun debate in inflammatory, even apocalyptic terms. If you sell guns for a living, a divided country is a plus. Business is better when people are on edge. But in reality, gun owners agree with non-gun owners on a wide range of safety initiatives. So I saw an opportunity here and I knew I was the right person to spearhead this project. Yesterday marked eight years since the shootings at Sandy Hook, and it feels like it happened yesterday. My kids were around the same age as the 20 young kids that were killed, and the revulsion we felt pushed my whole family into advocacy. And I'd grown up in Australia, a country that had successfully bent the curve on gun violence through smart laws that had popular support, so I knew it didn't have to be this way. Over the summer, I worked at the video news site Retro Report on their engagement team, where I learned valuable tools for interacting with an audience. I reached out to my community using some of those same tools. So that's email, social media, and surveys. I confirmed that my community feels ignored by the mainstream media and that they want to see news stories in new ways. My initial plan was to make a podcast. I'd been developing Half Cocked, a dark comedy series about a gun lobbyist whose relationship with a congresswoman whose son has been shot dead threatens to topple the entire gun industry. Half Cocked is unusual in that it uses a hybrid structure. The fictional story runs parallel to factual commentary from real people, such as journalists, students, and gun owners. I've produced scripted and experimental material before, and I was confident that this style could attract new audiences. The fiction strand allows me to bring together an unlikely couple from the farthest ends of the spectrum to dramatize ideas and emotions that are complex. The factual strand gives the podcast a visceral, experiential edge. It melds documentary and satire. And I felt this format could flourish in our media ecosystem because news, comedy and narrative already overlap. In fact, many of our most trusted journalists are in fact comedians. So through this lens, news becomes any useful curated information 
that is delivered to the audience in a way it will consume. Tina, uh, Tina Rosenberg, who's the co-founder of the Solutions Journalism Network, said it best in this op-ed for the New York Times. Scriptwriters understand that viewers can deal with nuance and contradiction, she wrote, while journalists too often seem to believe that audiences can't handle complexity. I made a trailer for the podcast that lives on the website, and here's a quick excerpt. You guys sell us on this great struggle against tyranny, like, like it's the Battle of Concord. But what do we get? Las Vegas, Charleston, Sandy Hook. You know it's more complicated than that. The hybrid approach is risky, and I did get some pushback, but most site users said they enjoyed the trailer and were very likely to share upcoming episodes. But by then, I'd already decided I wanted to provide more and different kinds of content. I was learning tons of new skills and techniques in my J school classes, and I wanted to use them. For instance, I learned how to build a voice record feature that lets my users leave me voicemails. I'd also added a gallery of videos that I've written and produced about the gun debate. One of the things I'm most proud of is the number of suggestions I now get from users asking for tailored video content about issues they care about. And the site continues to evolve. I'm developing an interface that gives my community data they can use to shame, prod, or support their elected officials. For instance, users can automate a social media response that calls out any financial relationship that might exist between their legislator and gun lobbyists. In many instances, engagement with my community looks like good old reporting. I send texts and emails and make lots of phone calls. The process is of course being upended by the pandemic, but we just bang through. I'm always talking to gun violence survivors like Shanae and Vertina because that keeps the project grounded. Other interactions happen through the Gun Country site or on my community's favored social media platform, Facebook. There's also less formal interactions, but they're perhaps more meaningful. I send happy birthday texts or I tell a user I'm thinking about them on the anniversary of a child's death. In terms of quantitative impact, here are some key performance indicators. People, uh, in the short time the site has been publicly available, we've had over 200 site sessions, small number, but growing. People generally come to the site from my email announcements I send out, so rather than social media postings. And that's a clue for future communications because it says my audience prefers email and maybe I can make a email newsletter for them. I also surveyed a subset of my most engaged, engaged users and a majority said they liked the site very much and were more than likely to suggest it to a friend. The site is also having a qualitative impact. It's giving users in my community a voice. And my eventual goal is a site that appeals as much to gun owners legislators and lobbyists, as it does to members of the gun safety movement. I haven't been as successful here as I'd hoped. Lockdowns have made face-to-face -face interaction all but impossible, and that is often what it takes to sway folks. Some gun rights advocates may also be turned off by my advocacy. They're not certain I can ever take off my gun grabber hat. My community understands though, this user lost her father to suicide 16 years ago, and she appreciates that the site attempts to hear from all sides. I believe Gun Country provides my community with well-reported material and solid tools that are of real use. It's also personally satisfying, having brought together two clear but divergent strands in my own life, my journalism and my advocacy. My interest in gun safety began long before CUNY, and this project ensures that it will continue long after I graduate. The project has also taught me many important lessons. For more about that, and for any lessons I might have for others, you can check out this Medium article. And I encourage you to visit the Gun Country site and to join this conversation, because to solve the gun crisis, we must first understand it. And thank you, and I'll leave you with this.